How is everybody doing? And welcome back for another Strength Chat episode. Today, I have got a very special guest for you all. Today, I'm joined by a coach who has helped guys get jacked, become the strongest version of themselves, all based on thousands of hours of real-world experience. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Jay Ferrugia. How are you doing? I'm oh, great, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No worries at all. Thanks a lot for taking the time to, to jump on. Uh, how are you? What's been happening in your world recently? Good. Everything's good. Um, nothing crazy, nothing different. Just uh, got a bunch of travel coming up, but um, everything's good, man. Oh, cool. And how did you, so for anyone anyone listening, I was lucky enough to um, hear Jay speak at the um, Kabuki Education Week. How did you, how did you, how did you find that? I was weird because, uh, you know, I'm used to doing talks like that in front of an audience. So I like to feed off the energy of the audience, get people to laugh, engage a little bit more. Um, but it was fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I kind of, I kind of felt that because I know based over, yeah, I was living on um, Pacific time for, uh, uh, for, for a week or so when it was, uh, when it was that on there. But um, I could tell that you know it would have been, um, it would have been good to have that talk in person because yeah. I could see you were wanting, uh, you, you were wanting that engagement. Um, yeah. Obviously, I did a little bit of a, of a brief in, introduction there. But, you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to that. You know, there's um, a, a lot of things that you've done, a lot of experience there. For anyone listening that might not know your background, do you just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself? Sure, yes. Yeah. I started out as a kid, you know, I was, I was I was fat, then I was skinny fat. I was insecure, shy, socially awkward. Um, and I wanted to overcome that. So I got into strength training. I used to watch pro wrestling every Saturday morning and, you know, grew up with superheroes and wanted to become, you know, like that larger than life character. And so I started training in like seventh or eighth grade. And by the time I graduated high school, five years later, I was six feet and 147 pounds. So it obviously wasn't working out that well. So I really had to do a deep dive. You know, if it worked out better and I had better genetics, maybe I would have never ended up doing this because I would have been like, oh, this is easy. I'll, you know, figure out something else to do for a career. Because I actually wanted to, uh, my major was communications. I wanted to get into like film and stuff like that. Um, but then I just became obsessed, you know, once you get bitten by the iron bug and I was obsessed with learning more and figuring it out for myself and then helping other people. Uh, so I started interning in the weight room, started training people when I was 19. Um, a couple of years later, opened up my first gym. It was literally underground. It was in a basement and that became a really well-known gym. We just, you know, pumped out. I was there 12, 15 hours a day for the next 15 years, pumped out a lot of great results, uh, high school, college, pro athletes. Um, you know, it became kind of well known for being one of those underground kind of warehouse style gyms. Uh, and then I got into all the magazines, you know, different websites, uh, wrote my first book with Penguin in 2007, been doing the podcast for nine years now. So, so I do speaking, consulting events, stuff like that. So it's been a long journey. It's been uh, like 27 years now. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I, I wanted to touch on that because there's a, there's a lot more to it than the, than the intro that I, that, that I mentioned there. And one thing that I wanted to touch on, and you, you mentioned this in, in, in your talk as well about uh, having the idea of like group training. And then all of a sudden now that's like the, that's like the new, uh, that's like the new thing. How have you, um, what are your thoughts on that sitting back from, you know, when, when you started out and seeing how it's grown and become so popular now? Yeah, it's crazy because nobody was doing it. Literally there was just one-on-one -on -one personal trainers or you could take classes like, like, you know, like Jane Fonda aerobics classes or something. And so I had a an athlete, uh, my first athlete, his name is Mike Schwab. Uh, to this day, you know, 25 years later, we're still good friends. I was at his wedding and everything. And uh, Mike referred me, he was coming, then he referred me another athlete, and then they referred me another guy, and they all wanted to train together. So I was like, well, why don't I just cut the price on the regular rate that I was training adults at? I'll make it the student athlete rate. And then all of a sudden it just blew up. And so we started with groups of four, then I expanded groups of six, and it was eventually like groups of eight to 12. And then I, I kind of taught that model to a lot of well-known guys, uh, you know, guys who were my age who were in the industry. I was like, yo, why are you still doing one-on-one? -on -one? Here's what I'm doing. You should do this. It makes so much more money. It's better. You'll have a better time. They'll have a better time. Uh, so it really kind of just grew from there. Now everybody does it. It's crazy. Yeah, definitely, and it, I find it interesting because it's that thing of um, uh, maybe a, maybe a little bit of a tangent on this. But did you actually find, especially within a um, an athlete uh, environment, you know, you mentioned there, you know, um, he referred a couple of a couple of guys to you. Did you feel as though uh, part of it was they pushed each other along, so the results kind of came with it? Because yeah. in some shape or form, a lot of people are competitive, so everyone's oh, so he's lifted that. I'm going to give that a go. Did did that how it how, how it kind of like materialized? If you like, yeah, hundred percent. It's just better when there's more people around. You feed off the energy. Um, you can break balls a little bit more. 
you know? <laughs> um, and then you get the guys breaking each other's balls. Like, it's weird if you're just one-on-one -on -one with someone and you call them weak or you call them a fat fuck. But, like, if three or four <laughs> guys are around, everybody kind of laughs. It's like, yeah, fuck this, you know? Like, they, they go harder. And it's just better energy. And also, there's not the downtime of you just sitting there with the person for two minutes going, all right, yeah, so what else is going on? It's like, all right, Mike, you're up. Chris, you're up. Joe, you're up. And everyone's kind of coaching and watching each other. And then what would happen, which was great with that, was guys would eventually raise up the ranks and they would kind of coach the new guys. They would haze the new guys. They would see if the new guys were a fit for the gym or not and be like, yo, you're not going to cut it here. We, we kick them the fuck out, you know? Yeah. He sounded, whole, yeah, because um, uh, for my for myself, coming from a, a, a rugby background and then um, competing, in, competing in powerlifting, it's kind of, the team environment that you have, it's the kind of like that same environment when it when it's in the gym, you know, everyone's got like the newbies, the rookies that if you like that, that come in and then you've, you've gained that experience a little bit more. One thing that, and this is something that I've spoken about with other other coaches over in the, uh, over in the UK is um, some people might come in and not really, the feel as though they're going to get um, more attention or like a better service from, from one to one, but then sometimes actually gravitate towards the group training because they realize that, wow, that actually looks pretty cool, you know, and they're still getting, still getting results. Is that what you found when you first started doing that as well? Yeah. Everyone wanted to be part of the group. Group's just way better. I mean, it just, you know, it's, it's how we are as humans, right? Everyone wants to be part of a tribe. So when you're sitting there with your coach one-on-one -on -one and you see all these other people having fun and they're high-fiving each other, competing, just a better environment, better atmosphere. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's, you know, you know, it's just pushing people, each other to, um, I can't remember the phrase, but it's kind of, you know, just creating that that culture, that uh, that culture of success and, and pushing each other along. And what I wanted to touch on today is, uh, and it's, you know, part of the talk that I, that I saw, uh, um, uh, heard you at uh, Community Education Week as well, kind of, you know, that thinking differently, that, um, you know, uh, putting yourself out there so acting in a way that you know you can actually change so if you want to be you know that um uh, i think in, in in the talking like what you mentioned there be that superhero be that person person that you want to be did group training kind of help you with that what's kind of the the background uh, uh the background to that to you know tend to be able to do you know speaking events coaching groups of people rather than you know just having that one person in front of you yeah. So I always say you got to act your way into thinking differently. So, so many people just, and I was guilty of this too. Uh, you know, I mean, you see a bookshelf behind me, but that's literally uh, a tenth of the books I used to have. And um, it's eating away at me to get most of those books, you know, donated somewhere. I want them all gone. <laughs> because what happens is so many people will read uh, dozens or hundreds of books, but they never get anywhere and they never take action. They're collecting information. They're trying to think their way into acting differently. Like, oh, I'm not ready yet. I got to read this other book. Yo, you should read this other book. Oh, Stephen recommended this book. I should read that. I should go to this workshop. I should listen to this podcast. I should do this. Uh, I got to get a little leaner first. I got to get a voice coach first. It's all these excuses and you never actually take action, get anywhere. And then you got to be honest with yourself. Like, okay, I've read, I've read this book. Cool. Now what's different about your life? Anything? No. What a fucking waste of time. I read this book. Cool. Are you making more money? Nope. Okay, yeah, I read this book. Okay, are you more confident? Are you speaking more? Are you develop better relationships? Nope. Well, then what are you doing? Like, you got to take action. So I think thinking is 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 a lot of people's greatest nemesis, like their arch enemy. Like, forget about thinking. Act your way into thinking differently. Meaning, you know, how just envision who is the person that you want to be. You can, first, I would say take five people that embody the characteristics that you want. Maybe their charisma, the way they engage people, how they carry themselves, the way they get shit done, their focus, their sense of humor, whatever it is, right? And what are the characteristics they, they embody? What do you want to embody? Now, how can you act like that person? Like, what would that person do? Whether that person's The Rock or uh, Chris Rock, whoever it is, like, okay, what would, how would The Rock enter the room? What would his posture look like? How would he make people feel? Uh, how confident would he be? What you know, weird, like kind of negative twitchy behaviors would he not have that you may have, right? So think of all these things and then just start to fucking do it every day. Change your posture, change, you know, everything about the way you look, the way you act, the way you move. And then all of a sudden it becomes natural. Whereas if you're just reading this book, it's like, it. you just got to do it immediately. And then whenever I'm at an event or when I work, I work with people like, cool, I see that this, you're kind of glossing out, like you're glazing out, like it's not work, like do it at fucking this break. Your posture when you leave the room 
and how you talk to people out in the hallway should be different. It's not tomorrow. It's not Monday. It's not when you write down and review all the notes. It's you do it now. And then every day you do it again. It's just like lifting. Like if you stop lifting, you're going to be weak and you're going to lose muscle. You do the shit all the time. If you stop eating healthy, your, your, your blood work's going to go to shit and you're going to get, you know, small and weak and fat or whatever. So you got to do these things all the time. It's just like showering. Like if you don't shower, you're going to stink. So you do the shit all the time, <laughs> time and time and time, day after day. You never get to a point where you're just, okay, you're just good at it. It's like, no, we're always working. We can always, everyone always wants more confidence, right? Everyone, everyone wants to be a better leader. Like those are superpowers. Everyone wants to be more charismatic. You could pick the greatest leaders, you know, war generals, the most charismatic people, uh, entertainers, whatever. They, it's a superpower to continually get better at it, right? So every day you should be working on those things. And then it just becomes, it does become who you are. Like for me, I don't have to work to be at this level anymore. Like I used to have to work really hard to be at this level, but now I need to work to get to this level. Like I used to be way down here and I had to act, I had to act my way to think differently to get here. Every day, it's, you know, it's a new challenge. You keep pushing yourself. And I always tell people, even maybe like track it, like you track your PRs in the gym or something. Mm -hmm. Like how many people did I engage today? How many people uh, did I give a compliment to? Did I make smile? Did I get out of my comfort zone and start a conversation where normally yesterday I wouldn't have because I would have been like, oh, that person doesn't want to talk to me. Yeah. And then the thing is, like the more insecure you are and the more you're inside your own head, you don't realize it, but you're just repelling people. People don't want to be around you. They, they might, I don't know if they feel bad for you. They feel empathy. Probably not. They just don't give a fuck. You're like, I, that's just bad energy. I don't want to be around that person. So by you thinking, oh, these people don't like me, they actually don't like you when you do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. you just got to act your way into thinking differently. Like, like I said, like either pick famous people or pick somebody, you know, like maybe your mm -hmm. buddy Johnny's like that. You're like, all right, how would fucking Johnny enter the room? You know, like, and you just do that shit every day. And then that becomes you. Like I'm this superhero version of myself where I wake up in the morning. I play my pump up music and I feel like there's a video camera on me at all times. When I'm walking down the street, it's a documentary film. There's a camera on me. How would I act? You know, so you got to do those things repeatedly. Yeah. Do you know what was actually going through my head there? Have you seen Fight Club? Yeah. Yeah. And do you know where they're in the car and he's like, what would you do? And they're driving and he's driving on the other side of the road and he's like, what would you what would you wish that you had done if it was it was your life and he's like i don't know i don't know and he's like oh actually my my life isn't that good or anything i don't know why but that was the that was the scene that was going uh, going through my head but i think for for something like that um kind of two two follow up questions from uh, from that with um well part of it as well is uh, i i get what you mean about those negative thoughts because sometimes what you think you can actually create make it think as though it's your reality, whereas actually it's just maybe, you know, your insecurities or something or something that you're thinking. Do you think from what people are reading and the like everything that you've said there, people are just, ex or, or coaches are just expecting things to happen after they've gained all this knowledge rather than, rather than taking action. And with that as well, um, how did you find when you said, you know, you're here and you're trying to, trying to get to there, what were kind of the obstacles and challenges that, that you found in terms of trying to trying to think differently and act differently and take it take it into action. Well, so I guess yeah, it's kind of a two part question there. Yeah, I mean, people think that when when they read something or go to an event or learn something, like all of a sudden something's going to change on Monday, but it doesn't. You have to take action, and people think that um, as you get older, things are going to get better. Like like wine, you just get better with age, right? But you don't. Like there's plenty of people in their sixties and seventies who never evolved because they never did the work. They never chose to. They're the exact same way. They have the same worldview, the same self-limiting beliefs, the same false narrative they had when they were 30. So you actually have to choose the actions each and every day. Like you're not entitled to anything. You don't get better. You have to do the work each and every day. And uh, now I kind of lost my train. I can't remember what, 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 the, what the question was there. Yeah, sorry. With the um, uh, when people are reading and um, uh, just expecting expecting things to happen rather than rather than putting the work in and kind of how how you started, you know, to try and implement implement those things because obviously all the things that you listed at the at the start, you know, talking and um, the the uh, the gyms that you open, the talks that you've done, you know, it's then you know uh, built momentum into your career, if you like. Yeah, it just comes down to to actually doing those things, right? And you get. You got to simplify it where everybody is overwhelmed with information these days. They have a million different opinions and ways to do things. So you got to really just narrow it down to like 
what are five daily non-negotiables? What are the five things? Like even if you look at business, you can't do more than five things well each day, five productive things. People will try to do 17 and then they're miserable because they have anxiety from this long checklist of shit that they didn't get done. You can only really do five things and some people it might be three that's actually going to move the needle. Like what's actually moving the needle in your business? Or are you just doing bullshit, uh, you know, busy work, which is most people most of the time. Um, and then you have to, for your, for your life in general, like we all have rules for sports. There's rules. You can't drive a certain, and you know, you can't steal, whatever it might be. Um, you have to create rules for your life. If, if, if your, your life is out of control, uh, there's chaos, there's anxiety and stress. It's because you don't have rules. You don't like structure. You need that structure and, and that, that discipline creates freedom. So you need to build that into your life. Like most people think, and I've heard this for 27 years. Oh, you're self-employed. There must be so much freedom. That's great. I want to do that. And I'm like, no, you don't. You would have no idea how out of control you're going to be. Like, you're better off working for somebody else where they tell you to be here and do this at this time. Unless you're disciplined as a motherfucker or willing to become disciplined as a motherfucker and create that in your life. And so when I, when I created that by saying, okay, I get up at this time every single day and go to bed at this time every single day. The first hour of my day, this is what I do. And then a timer goes off and that's it. I move on to the next thing. And the timer goes off and I do this thing and I train at this time every day and I don't do anything. Uh, I don't take any calls or meetings before 10 a.m. because from six to 10 is my focus time. So I have those rules. So it doesn't matter if the rocks in town says, hey, I want to train at 930. I go, we got to wait till 1030. I'm doing my shit here. So like you got to have those non-negotiables and those rules and build that structure. That's worth worth sitting down and thinking about. That's worth taking a weekend, getting out a pad, creating those things. Now live by that and go out and act your way into all those things every single day. But at least you know what you're acting into. It's like, okay, I got to adhere to these five things every day. And I'm acting my way into embodying like those personality traits and characteristics that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And when you said that, you know, obviously things uh, develop, develop over time. How much uh, refinement did it, did it take to get to that point? Or was it a case of, right, these are the, the rules that, 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 that you've set? This is what I'm going to stick to. So it, be, it creates that discipline and creates that control, like what you mentioned. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I, I think it's just re repeatedly doing the things and getting better over time. You know, um, it's always a work in progress, right? Like maybe you have your five daily non-negotiables, and then in six months, this one's a no-brainer. It's like I'm going to do that no matter what. Yeah. So maybe you you swap that out. You don't even have to look at that on your daily you know journal or whatever anymore. It's like I'm doing that no matter what. Like I'm never missing a workout no matter what, or I'm never not getting up at six no matter what. Like whatever it is for you, then maybe you can add a new one in, and that becomes your thing. Like you're like oh, I'm close on this one, but I got to really lock it in and make it a non-negotiable, make it a rule. So I think I think it's always a moving target. It's always a work in progress, seeing what works best for you. But if you're changing every fucking day, you're getting nowhere. You got to you know give stuff ninety days. Yeah, absolutely. And why I asked that is a little bit like what you mentioned there. You know, you're you've worked hard to get to that point, and then it's like right now you're at that point. It's there. Whereas I think, and I, I don't know what your thoughts are, but sometimes uh, some people, I don't know whether it's a mistake or a, or a pitfall, they want to they kind of like miss that step and be like, right, well, I'm just going to go straight straight to this one. Do you think that's where sometimes people get it get it wrong and then they end up crashing and burning, if you like? No, I think it's just they overcomplicate it and try to do too much. So really success comes down to not that you're not doing all the things. Uh, it's, it's not the things you're not doing. It's the things that you are doing that you need to eliminate. Like Bruce Lee said, think about extract, uh, subtraction rather than addition. So the most successful people are probably there because of the things they're not doing than the things they are doing. It's definitely some of the things they are doing, but it's a lot of the things they're not doing. So unsuccessful, undisciplined, miserable people who don't make the money they want, don't have the life they want. You could chalk most of that up to the things that they are doing that successful people don't do. You know, that that's, that that list is a mile long. Wasting time, gossip, this, that, scrolling, second guessing, doubting, overthinking, you know, all those things. Yeah, absolutely. I think it I, I think you know, touching on that, um the, the the phrase that came to mind is like busy doing nothing. So investing things, investing in time um that isn't isn't gonna get get anywhere. I know there's um uh, there's a there's a coach that I work quite closely with and um there's a I can't remember whether it was question a questionnaire or anything. We basically went through the things it was like a values questionnaire, what's important to us, what are the things that we enjoy doing and we do regularly, and then all of a sudden, like like what you mentioned actually, there's like three 
three uh, three to five things of oh, okay so i like doing uh the podcast so i do the podcast every week and I, i'm consistent with that i like writing so i'm gonna write blogs i'm gonna find time to do it and then all of a sudden there's more energy in that rather than trying to be like right well i need to do this 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 and this that isn't necessarily um you know uh the it's not the the efforts that you're putting in aren't and, and get aren't getting people anywhere. So yeah, I think that makes that, that that makes quite quite a lot of sense. In terms of you know the um when you've said there about you know that that repeatability about um getting those uh, getting those habits in and, and and making it from there, you also touched on sort of business and life. Is there a crossover on where those habits um happen, or is it a case of they're very like um separated in terms of how I'm going to carry myself in my life is different for business or can they have a knock-on effect on on each other in terms of success no I think they should just all mesh together yeah yeah I think it should just all be these are the things you do this is the person you are to just yeah intersect yeah because sometimes I think it's to, to expand on that a little bit I think sometimes um that it's a case of they want to keep things quite um separate from the from the business side of things whereas actually you know uh into especially in terms of coaching people buy into people so do do you think that you know what you've shared there about you know the the wrestling that you know wanting to um have that transformation be that be that superhero do you think that's allowed uh you know to be able to build that that relationship and um uh, help with help with your career if you like it's the only way that you're going to grow grow a business in 2023, I mean, I started doing that in, in uh, I, I got online in 2001 and I shared pretty much everything about me personally and built a personal brand. Uh, if you don't build a personal brand and share things about yourself, you're out of business because, oh, what are you going to do? You're going you to sell your training system? Oh, wow, that guy does Westside. I never heard of that. Oh, that guy does uh, low volume. That guy trains like uh, Dorian Yates. I never heard of that. Oh, that guy does five by five. That's fucking unique. Vegan, carnivore. I never heard of that. It's like no, none of that shit fucking matters. It's you and your personality. That's the only fucking thing that's going to make any difference. So you got to go super hard on sharing what you're about, what you hate, what you like. If, you know, if maybe you curse, you don't curse, whatever it is about you. Like put that out there. People only buy people. If you're a coach, people only buy you. They don't buy your training system. They don't give a fuck about your training system. Now, that being said, be really good. Deliver results because at the end of the day, if you're not delivering results, you're also out of business, but they're coming in more so for you than like if three guys might have, I mean, fuck, 3,000 guys have the exact same training system, right? But it's like, who am I going to go to? The guy that I connect with, you know? I mean, the insane thing is that's how people vote for the president sometimes, you yeah. know? Like, you know, so it's, you know, personality is everything, putting it out there. Yeah. And with that, because we've, when you're talking about that personality side of things, there's a lot of things that people put, oh, well, I'm an evidence-based uh, uh, coach or I'm a... No one gives a fuck. Yeah. What, why <laughs> what, Why? Do, why is that? Because um, at one point, everyone was an evidence-based trainer. <laughs> like, why, why Why do you think... Why? Because obviously, there's people... Everyone's got an opinion on something, on some training. It's a little bit like, I always say, I'm not the biggest fan of kettlebells. I can use them, but... The main reason why I don't like kettlebells is because I'm not as efficient with them. And every time I do anything, I get bruised forearms and, you know, all, all, all those sorts of things. But that's just my opinion. It's not. So, so no, 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 no. So, so here, I'm going to reframe that for you for yeah. how you can improve your business. Kettlebells fucking suck. Why would anyone <laughs> use them? They break your fucking forearms. Next day, my wrist kills, my elbow kills, my shoulder kills. They're fucking useless. It's a circus act. It, it's, a, it's a skill that takes 10 years to learn. Why would I do that when I could just give someone a dumbbell press, right? Like, so if you take a hard stand, it's way fucking better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you, know you think saying? that? Do and you... the evidence-based thing, you know who's evidence-based? People have been training for 30 fucking years. There's my evidence. I, I did this. I don't fucking evidence-based. Uh, evidence-based is I read the latest study. I read the latest. I don't read the latest study. I read what someone who knows how to read studies interpreted, and then I regurgitate it, and then it changes next week, and I go, "Oh, just kidding! Oh, just kidding! Sorry, just kidding!" Because <laughs> you have no fucking uh, evidence. You have no real evidence of your own to stand on. You haven't done shit. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's it reminds me. I was I was lucky enough to have um, Jim Wendler on the on the on the on the podcast, and yeah, now that's uh, a guy who's got fucking evidence, and he ain't reading PubMed all day. Absolutely, Jim, Jim and I were close friends for years. We kind of fell out of contact, but I love Jim. He, he's a guy who's got evidence. Oh, cool. Yeah, and from you know his experience, actually, actually in the gym. Do you think for a lot of um, uh, younger coaches coming into the industry, because obviously, you know, especially with COVID and social media, you know, it's the same as everyone can be like an online coach now. That sometimes they don't actually have that. They never actually done the training that they've that they've said bef- that they've you know that they're, they're prescribing that they're they're actually reading about and learning about. Going back to right at the start about. I know we spoke about the the mindset side of thing and the business side of things, but actually from a training standpoint, they're they're just saying these things, but they never actually experience them them themselves, if you like. Yeah, so so be a hundred percent authentic. Like I don't have I think that holds a lot of people back where they're like, Oh man, I have 20 years experience and this guy just started 20 days ago and he's making cash and shit. It's like, yeah, who cares? Don't worry about that. Envy and jealousy and bitterness and anger only hold you back. That doesn't matter. If that guy's making cash and you're not. You fucking suck. Your 20 years is worthless. He dominated you in 20 days. So A, that's the first mindset. Uh, Number two is, what if that guy was 300 pounds and got down to 180 over two years, and that's who he's going to help? Other people who are 300 pounds. He's not claiming to be Louis Simmons or, you know, like the greatest trainer of all time. He's like, yo, this is what I did. Here, I'm going to coach you guys. I, I just cut down from five bags of Doritos to two. Here's how you can do it. Here's what I did. Like, oh, great. If that guy makes a million dollars doing that, great. More power to him. Like, you should want everyone to succeed. You should be happy for everyone's success. You should want uh, the best for everybody. Otherwise, you're just killing yourself. So I, I think that's fucking great. If you try to be something you're not, where you're like, hey, you know, I, I did X, Y, and Z, and you're lying to people, or you're telling them, oh, you're the greatest, or, you know, you're, you're, you're regurgitating shit where you're like, well, the moment arm and this, and, you know, you should abduct your... It's like... Yeah, bro, you don't know any. We don't know what any of that shit means. Like, don't do that. Just be honest, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I think that we with everything, you know, and uh, there's that much information out there that, like, what you say, it can just be regurgitated and, and and just and just sent out from there. Do you think? Because obviously, you said about you know who you're trying to train. If if the if one trainer has gone from um uh, being you know really overweight to then you know uh, drop it dropping lots of lots of weight. Do you think having that target and who you're actually actually speaking to rather than I think at some point everyone's trying to speak to everybody and try and be that of uh, that um what's the phrase a, uh, a jack of all trades ma- master yeah, of none yeah. is yeah, is, yeah, is yeah. that a, a common mistake that you think I, I think for sure especially if you're starting out if, if you you know you're not doing really well you're not getting a lot of traction that that's huge you know any business expert will tell you you got to determine who it is that you're actually speaking to if you appeal to everyone try to appeal to everyone you'll appeal to no one uh, that is important you maybe you get to a certain level where that doesn't matter anymore as much I mean, it would still probably help you scale your business more, but you know, maybe you find a, that comfort zone where you're like, "Oh, this is good. I like this." But then that's going to be strong personality-based marketing, personal branding. Where if you had a really strong personal brand and people are just attracted to you, where a lot of people hate your guts and a lot of people love you, you know, like like a Howard Stern or something like that, then you can really appeal to a much wider market. But when you're starting out, even if you your personal brand uh, or your personality, I should say, because you won't really have a brand if you're just starting out. If your personality is great, still talk to a specific audience. If you like, like the you know the hypothetical I gave of the guy who was three hundred pounds and got down to one eighty. If he's talking to those people, great. If he's trying to sell me and you and my mom, like he's out of business, right? So like, or if someone gets people ready for bodybuilding competition, great. He's he should just talk to those people. Someone trains people for golf, great. Talk to those people, right? Like if you just talk to everyone all the time. I mean, I was fortunate enough that I could do it back in the the nineties. And you can get away with it. You, it's hard to get away with it now. Really hard. Yeah, especially when there's you're leaving stuff out uh, out there because there might be like blogs or posts that people can find. Say, oh, well, actually, actually, you know, you you said this. There's there's always going to be something that you, that you can refer back to. One thing, and this might be this might be a little bit of a a, a little bit of a tangent, but you you we we spoke a lot there about uh, being authentic. You know, being honest, speaking to the people in front of you. And, there seems to be a, a, a trend at the at the minute that you know a lot of coaches want to um, 
set themselves aside from you know a, a everybody else. You know, everyone knows that the the barbells and the and the, and the dumbbells. You know, the the work people have been using them for for years and years. Whereas throwing out somewhere you know outlandish like. Um, you know, I'm going to stand on a, a Swiss ball and do a squat. This is going to be the best exercise for balance that just to try and kind of um, make some noise so that people will look at look at what they're doing. Do you think that uh, coaches are just doing that so, so they can um, get some visibility on, on, on social media? And do they do you think that they actually believe it or they're just doing it to, to make some noise? Well, you, you, you will get some traction. You might get a lot of followers. Play stupid game, games, win stupid prizes. So you do that shit. Yeah, you might get a lot of people following you. Like a, a girl showing her ass, you might get a lot of people following you. But you're not making cash. So what yeah. are you doing? Well, you're wasting your time, right? So you got you to have an end, end game in mind. Like, is it just the follower count? Because I know people who have 10,000 followers that make seven figures. And I know people that have seven figure following that, that make 10 grand. Yeah. So what what's the purpose of this? Is it just to stroke your ego and live in a, a one bedroom apartment, or are you actually trying to help people and actually grow your business? Because it's not just like people will be like, oh, you should just try to help people. Yeah, I get that for sure, but it's not just philanthropy to teach people how to squat. Like you'd go to the dog shelter or go to a homeless shelter or go to a third world country and dig them out after an earthquake. You know, like and you're not just teaching people how to do a, a preacher curl just for your philanthropic work. You know what I mean? So yeah, you know, there's a balance there. Absolutely. And I think you, you kind of, um, that's a, that's a really good point because a hundred percent, you know, that, um, you know, as, as, as coaches, as trainers, you know, we want to, we want to help people, but ultimately, you know, everyone's got bills to pay at the end, at the end of the day, everyone wants, you know, a better life or a better house or a better car or go on holidays or, or whatever it is. So yes, there has to be that level of you know generally caring about your about your clients. I had um I had a, a woman compete at a powerlifting competition last weekend, and I think I got more excited her competing than I did actually me competing. She yeah. just, got a couple of PBs, which is really cool. But equally, you know, she has been paying me. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of that thing of you know yes, you know I want them to I want them to do well, but it's obviously services you know services that we that we're paying from there. Yeah. The flip, the the flip side of that is, you know, um, people targeting uh, or um, I know we spoke about, you know, a specific target audience, but uh, a particular uh, modality of, of training of, you know, this is the only way that you want to do. Whereas, you know, the the ghosts kind of so far down that rabbit hole that that they're not going to be open to other. Um, uh, other other methods or systems or be like oh, okay so we you know we can we can try this how does that sort of impact business as a as, as a trainer or, or, or a coach if that if that kind of makes sense um you know but based on my previous answers my, people might be surprised by this but i think sometimes that's a good thing mm. um because again if you try to be everything to everyone you try to appeal to everyone you, you do everything uh then you just become like commoditized shit where it's like, yeah, I do kettlebells, I do barbells, I do powerlifting, I do bodybuilding, I do sports performance, I do rehab. It's like, yeah, no. There's people who just do one of those things, you know, and do it really well. Like Kelly Starrett's just the rehab guy. He's not the hypertrophy guy. He's not, you know, uh, John Berardi built a multi, multi-million dollar business just being the nutrition guy. Uh, Pavel does a bunch of things, but he's really been the kettlebell guy. Uh, my friend Marcus, he's kettlebell exercises on uh, – uh, IG and he he does well just doing kettlebell stuff. So from a business perspective, I think it is good uh, to definitely separate yourself from just being one of those. Because if, if if you're if you're not a specialist and you do everything, it, like I said, it is commoditized schlock, and people are like, eh, whatever. Like you, you could do everything, but be like the uh, the sports performance guy or the maximal hypertrophy guy or whatever. Then you could do everything. You got to pick like a couple different lanes. Like if you're just everywhere doing everything and servicing everybody, that's really bad. Yeah. Do you do you think that's a case of um because you know uh, a lot of things that get get mentioned is kind of like scaling uh, scaling the business. So whether it's a case of you know taking on uh, another coach or going to a gym or you know what whatever it may be. Do you think not having that specialist area that like what you're known for, it's very hard to then scale your business and then be like, right, okay, I'm known as this. And then I can do talks about it. I can do an ebook about it or a book or something like that. Do you think 100%, it's hundred percent? Yeah. You yeah. have to have your system and your specialty or you're never going to scale the business. It's, it's just you and your knowledge and your brain. 
And so you'll just have a job forever. You'll never be able to grow. So you, and that was one thing, you know, like, like I go back to the, the late nineties when I was talking to Joe DeFranco about uh, training one-on-one versus training groups, what he was doing that was better than what I was doing was he would have everyone on that one system. And I would say, yeah, but these are 13 year old kids who have never trained before. He's like, yeah, but then it'll be a clusterfuck. I was like, ah, genius. Yeah. That's the only way you could do it. Like if you went to West side, Louie wouldn't say, oh, we're all doing dynamic squats today, but you're a beginner, so you're just going to do five by five over in the corner. It's like, no, you're just jumping in. You're doing eight sets of three with 45 seconds rest. So you have to have your system and your thing, right? Like Dorian Yates has his high intensity, so he could hire me and you and five other guys and be like, yo, here's how we do it. We work up to one set of six to ten. We go to failure. We rest for a minute. You know, like you have to have that. And and the, the more you could check boxes, the easier it is to scale and hire people because it's like, okay, we only do – this is our specialty, let's say hypertrophy. And we only do, let's say, gate style training or high volume, whatever the fuck, Ronnie Coleman. We, uh, we only train uh, people that are over 40, right? So like now it gets easier. Now you could teach in a weekend your whole team and your whole staff. Now you have something that you could scale. Where if you're training everybody, forget it. That's just on you. And good luck hiring people and teaching them. And then also good luck having like a good um, – boss to client team kind of relationship because you're always gonna be like oh why'd you do it that way we're like i don't know there's 50 different things going on here you know yeah absolutely and from from there as well because i know obviously we've uh, a lot of people will say because I, I was um actually lucky enough to do my um my first uh seminar um before before christmas last year which i, I thought i thought was pretty cool um awesome. and it's that it's that thing of you know at some point it's kind of um which I, I don't know whether, uh, and I, I've kind of had this thought process of that at some point you actually get a little bit further away from the actual hands-on, you know, cold face coaching. And then like what you say, start developing the, those systems. How did, how did you kind of, kind of find that, 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 that transition, if you like? Um, you mean from getting away from being on the gym floor every day? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, again, you just have to have your kind of systems and all that in play. Yeah. So for me, like I said, where, where the younger guys would move on and become coaches, I meant that in a literal sense too. Like some would be just coaches, but some were actually paid coaches. So those are going to be your best guys, right? Guys who have gone through your system. Uh, even, even now, if you're just online, guys who are clients went through your system, they know it, they like you, they trust you, they're fans of your work, they've gone through those would be great employees. Those of like online, those have been my greatest employees. And in the gym, those have been my greatest employees. So people that have been around, they get to know everything. Um, and then it becomes easy to train them. Uh, so really that was the thing. And then just, you know, slowly removing myself and giving those guys, you know, empowering those guys more, letting people see that those are the guys who are running stuff. And I'm here, I'm popping around, but I'm not doing the thing all the time. And I might step out. I might be gone for an hour. I might be gone for three hours. Uh, that, that's a good way to do it at the gym. And then you're kind of just like the master of ceremonies. Like you just come in, you, you maybe high five some people, you go, Oh, here, here, come here. Your squat looks great, but just tweak this a little bit. Like you're always there. You're making people feel special. You're touching them. You're, you're saying, Hey, I heard it was, uh, your son's birthday, whatever. Like you're doing this personal one-on-one -on -one stuff, but you, they can't expect that it's just you all the time. Cause again, yeah. like I said before, then you're just handcuffed to that job forever. Yeah, absolutely. And with and with that, um, did that allow you to then um kind of go in, you know, uh, full circle when we've spoken about being able to do other things and, and, and public speaking and, and, and those sorts of things? Did that then allow you to put more efforts into, you know, the 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 books and actually putting into action the things that you wanted to do and you know be able to then, you know, deliver seminars and talks and podcasts and, and those sorts of things. So then actually you've you've scaled your own sort of mindset and, and thoughts on on how you want it to be. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, yeah, you can't do all those things if you're just, you know, working 12, 15 hours a day. So you got to scale back. Even if you're just a one man show, you got to figure out how to maybe, you know, train more groups instead of one on one, whatever it is. Like you got to scale back your hours. So even if it's just you have two or three hour chunk in the middle of the day that you previously didn't have, figure out a way to get that so you can start working towards the other stuff, building the other stuff, working on the skill set that you have, you know, so you can go to classes or, you know, take speaking classes or whatever it might be. Like you got to, because some people will just never make that time. They'll be like, I, I can't, I'm too busy. And you work 12 hours a day forever. You got to make that time. So you got to get smarter. Maybe you got to charge more, right? Like there's all kinds of ways that you can make the time, but you have to make the time.
Yeah, definitely. It is that it is that thing you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, if you're working so many hours, how how are you actually going to to scale to to develop to be able to work work on work on those things uh, things from there? And you know, I think it comes back to I think everything that we've chatted about. You know, we we kind of. Um, putting the pieces together is it comes back to then developing those systems like what you said about these are the rules that you that you need to do and at some point those rules have to be added in so that you're not working as many hours so whether that be you know a case of and I, I was actually having this conversation a, a couple of weeks ago that if prices cut if you know your, your prices go up you know your, mem- your membership or the clients that you share might go down but you know it's more quality of that you know it's, it's those it's those peaks and troughs of it whereas I think sometimes um, there can potentially be that fear of failure, like what if it goes wrong? But then equally, how I like to think is what if it goes right? What if actually it takes you to that to that point that you need to um uh, that you want to get to, which is you know that whole thought process of of thinking differently. Um quite a few topics um chatted about there and a, a few tangents thrown in as well. Um but the the last question that I like to um that that I like to ask is from everything that we've chatted about um today what would be your uh, take home points or words of wisdom? I would just say, you know, spend some time, take out a notebook and and, and write down the person that you want to be. What are those five characteristics that don't don't make it 95, don't make it 17, like just make it five. What are five characteristics of the idealized version of yourself. Who do you want to be when you enter a room? Who, what, what do you want? Like you're writing your eulogy at all, at all times. What people say about you at your funeral, you control that. You're actually writing that. So write that down. Write down those five characteristics. And then immediately just start to become that person. How would that person act? And, and embody that. And like I said, act your way into thinking differently. And then that's, that's how you change the world. That's how you inspire people. Kobe Bryant said the most important thing is to inspire other people so that they can be great. So the only way you're going to inspire someone is if you are at your highest level. You're living life at your highest level with your most confidence, your most discipline. You're doing the things. You're embodying the characteristics. You're the person you want to be. Then someone says, oh, man, how are you doing that? It's amazing. Oh, you lost 30 pounds. Oh, how do you not drink when we're all out drinking? How do you not eat shit we're all eating shit? Like, how do you stay on that path every day? That's super inspirational for me. So that's what I would say to people. Awesome. Absolutely. I think that was uh, some really good take take on points. Yeah. And uh, I like the fact, yeah, pick pick five. It's not, you know, you're not writing your autobiography. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's five things because then that way, um, you know, it's that thing of um, I've actually got um, uh, he's, he's kind of become a little bit of a mentor, if you like. And he's got um, a phrase that he's got in his wallet and he reads it every morning. And it's like, right, this is this is how we how we're gonna do it. And I'm I'm trying, I'm trying to get better at that. I'm trying to like, right, you know, on a morning, this is um th- this is this is you know setting yourself up for, for for that day. And um to be fair, when I when I do it, when I do it, you know, it's a it's a completely different day to when to to when I don't do it. Um thanks a lot, Jay, for taking the time to jump on. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat today. Really enjoyed it. Um for everyone listening who might have any um, questions about what we've chatted about today, see the content that you put out there, um, listen to your podcast, where can people um, find you or, or reach out to you? Yeah, no, well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, J.Fit. And on Instagram, I'm at Jay Ferugia and uh, Renegade Strength Show is the podcast. Awesome. Um, thanks again for taking the time to jump on. Thanks to everyone listening. And I will see you all next week.